All right, uh, I think we have most of you. Let's get started. So in today's lecture, we're gonna talk more about sequential logic, uh, especially flip-flops. I'll also give you guys a quick intro of Verilog. This is something that uh, you guys just starting to learn, right? So as part of lab two, hopefully this lecture will solidify some of your understanding. Okay, first a uh, few announcements. Uh, you might have noticed that we have updated the due times, right, the deadlines for lab two. Um, there was some mistake right, due to some miscommunication uh, between me and the TAs, right, long story. Um, but going forward, right, so, you know, all the assignments, uh, like what the syllabus says, right, will be due in midnight. Okay, right, so thanks uh, to one of you who um, you know, caught this problem. And uh, we'll be posting homework three tonight. Uh, I originally planned to release it a bit later, um, but after second thought, I think it's a good idea for you guys to have more practice questions before the, the first prelim. Okay. And speaking of prelim one, uh, it's gonna happen in two weeks, okay, on March 16th, uh, during the class time. Right? It's gonna be virtual, right? Uh, over Zoom. So we are gonna figure out the, the actual format pretty soon. So we'll send out more information about that. Um, but first thing first, right? So in case you have a schedule conflict, right? So in case uh, the slot does not work for you, for whatever reason, let us know ASAP, okay? This, you are not supposed to have a schedule conflict, right? So that's actually one of the reasons we pick this class time, unless you're doing remote learning. But again, regardless, right? So if there's anything, so let us know ASAP. And um, we're going to cover, so for this prim, we're going to cover the first seven lectures. And these are the topics, right? Finding numbers, right? Boolean algebra, CMOS, right? Commercial logic, sequential logic, right? Latch, flip flop, and such. Um, and a little bit on Verilog. Okay. Uh, basically, today's lecture is also part of the, the coverage. And um, we're going to be scheduling a review session led by TAs, um, most likely on March 11th. Okay, we announce the time. And uh, of course, because not everyone will be um, able to attend that, so we're gonna record it. And uh, we also post a sample exam pretty soon on CMS later this week. Okay, uh, we will give you guys more information soon. Let's see if there's any questions. Any questions? Okay, again, for brilliant one, so this is the last lecture that we'll cover. One through seven. Okay, one more time. Uh, make sure that you guys let us know right, if this thought does not work. All right. Okay, so to pick up where we left off, right? Last week, uh, there are a few questions on item pool. Let me start, uh, let me share the screen for the other one. All right, so let's do a few exercises on item pool. Okay. So last time we covered ledges, okay. three flop, clock. You guys um, go to item pool. I'm gonna start start the session. All right. So first question, right? So how many transistors do you need? So by transistor, I refer to both PMOS and MOS. Compose. There are already some different opinions, okay? Two, four, six, eight. We'll move on pretty soon, okay? Just think about the composition of this SR latch, right? So what's in there? Right. So interesting, right? So the, the class is pretty divided about this question. Right, let's see. Okay, it's stabilizing. I'm gonna be first let's, let's see. Okay. Right, so good that the majority, right? 23 of you, right, chose B, right? Many of you are not that far off, right? Uh guess. Now, the reason you choose two is because you're talking about the gates, right? Not transistors. Okay. Um, why, why is eight? We have two NOR gates, right? Two input NOR gates that form the SR latch. 
Each neural gate requires how many transistors? Two PMOS, two NMOS, right? That's how the, the neural gate is composed. Same thing for NAND, right? We need four transistors per neural gate. Also, we need four transistors per NAND gate. Okay, two transistors per inverter, right? Inverter is sort of the simplest kind of gate that we learned in this class. Make sense, right? Eight, let's see uh, if there's any questions or not. Okay, next one. Make sense, eight, right? Eight transistors. So if you agree on this, my next question is, can we build a D-latch using eight transistors? Right, it's a yes and no question. Think about what is a D latch, right? What's the difference between a D latch and an SR latch? Okay. Looks like in this case, uh, right? So the majority of class is agreeing on one of the answers. All right, let's see. Okay. No, right? Because we just talked about SR latch. There we need eight transistors, right? With a D latch, you think about D latch, it's actually built on top of SR latch, right? So we actually need additional logic. We add additional logic on top of SR latch. Since we already need eight transistors for SR latch, obviously we need more, right? Think about how many more. All right, hopefully this is helpful, right? For us to review some of the concepts. Last one, how about SR latch, D latch, how about D flip flop? So DFF changes state, then input changes, and the clock signal is high. Is it true or false? Think about whether D flip flop is level sensitive or edge sensitive. Well, interesting, okay. Looks like, you know, again, we, uh, we have very divided opinions right, on this question. So I'm glad that I'm asking this question, right? So looks like this is gonna indeed help you guys clarify some of the, the confusions. All right, uh, so let's see. Okay. Actually, you know, in this case, uh, right? So B is the correct answer, right? We are talking about flip flop here, not D latch. D latch is level sensitive, right? So D latch accept new inputs when the clock signal is high, but flip flop only accept new input when we are seeing this like the right, transition edge, right, or triggering edge. So we were talking about this rising edge trigger. So that's where we have, right? So, you know, when the clock is going from low to high, so that's where D flap changes state. Okay, hopefully this is useful, right? Um, but it's good to see that, you know, many of you are, are getting the, the right answer, right? Um, but looks like this is indeed useful for you guys to refresh your mind right, about some of the key concepts. Okay, let's go back to the lecture slide. First, any questions about this exercises? Okay. If not, um, give me a second. Let me help you try to remind. Uh, let me help you remind. Right, you know, like go over some of the concept again. All right. Okay. All right. So first. We talk about SR latch, right? Uh, last time, you know, we also did a quiz about the, uh, you know, sort of a variant, right? So we also talk about this uh, SR R bar latch. So where we are building the latch using NAND gate, right? Not NOR gate. And this is a quiz question, right? So I think in the quiz, I asked you guys about the, this is a hold, right? So the hold behavior. So when the SR latch, SR R bar latch can hold the state, 
by looking at the name, right? So you guys can probably already guess, right? So based the behavior is opposite, right? So we hold uh, when both of these are ones, right? When both of them S and R are ones. So, you know, it's really about uh, really first, this is not the nor gain, right? So since the bubble is on the input side, so we are actually looking at, right? The NAND gate, right? So when we are talking about NAND gate, so when do we hold when both of these gates, right? Regress to inverters, right? So that's that's where we have this bistable element, okay? Uh, so when do we have inverter for NAND gate? So when the input is one, right? Okay, so that's where uh, when we both have S and R being one, so we have hold. And this is the, the entire truth table. Right? I'm also showing the entire truth table for this S bar, R bar latch, right? So this is latch, right? And we can use S R bar, S bar, R bar latch or S R latch to build D latch, right? Uh, with D-Latch, we have something called a level sensitive device. But I keep saying these terms, right? So because these are really important. So by level, I'm really talking about the, the level of the clock. Is it at high level or low level, right? Level high or level low. So by default, usually, so when we say D-Latch, we usually talk about, right? So when, when C, right, is high, then this D-Latch is open, it's accepting new inputs, right? So when C is high, so this is related to the exercise that we just did, right? Um, because you guys were thinking about the D latch, right? Not D flip flop. Okay, when you answer uh, the option A, right? when you select it, true. Um, but for flip flop, okay, maybe let me ask you guys a question, right? So we just talked about D latch, right? So it's actually formed by SR latch, right? So what is D flip flop? What's in D flip flop? How many, how many latches do we need in D flip flop? Feel free to right? Two, okay, two, very good, right? So we have two D latches, right, back to back. So that we have this uh, very interesting edge sensitive behavior. Right, so basically capture the input right at the rising edge or triggering edge. Okay, so the, um, the acronym for flip flop is FF. Right, so in many cases also say DFF. Another common way to call this flip flop is register. Okay? You will see this term a lot, right? Especially you know, when you're writing Verilog. Right, so basically let's say you reg. Right, uh, this is a shorthand for register. Um, but later on, we'll see like in rare law, this kind of tricky. When I say reg, this may not become a free flop. Okay, this may become something else, right? This is something that we're going to discuss. But uh, going forward, right? So when I say FF or DFF or register, they all refer to free flop. Okay? And also, uh, in terms of symbol, again, pay attention to this triangle, right? So in exam or problem set, so you see a tri triangle, this means that we are looking at a free flop. This triangle means, you know, we are responding to the, the edge. Right, so uh, you know we just discussed, right? So we actually need two D latches, right, to form a flip-flop. Um, this is sort of like a two-door system, right? Uh, in this class, I'll try really hard to give you guys the intuition, right? Some analogies, right? But for flip-flop, you know, this is sort of like a um, again a two-door system, right? So one imprecise analogy is this uh, sort of a you know uh, if you have been to some airport like Sy Syracuse Air Airport. And I think the, the new one in Ithaca also has a system where you have this exit portal, right? So where you need to go through a two door system. Right? You need to first go through the first door right? and enter the portal. So then the first door will close before the second door opens. Right? So at any given time, only one door will stay open. Okay, so this will allow, you know, sort of this one way traffic, right? Ensure the one way traffic. So that's why they're doing this right, in, the, in the airport. Um, so that's one imprecise analogy. Right? So when you think about flip flop, always think about there are like two doors. So basically, um, you know, this, um, this kind of a rising edge trigger flip flop, right? So we can actually draw, let's say we draw, we talked about waveform last time, right? Clock is basically a square ish waveform, right? There's a clock. Um, 
let's say we name this edges, right? We talk about rising edge, right? R1, right? So this one, R2, okay? Yeah, we can call it R3. We can also name some of the falling edges because last time some of you are asking about these falling edges, right? F2, F3. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. Uh, I'm using a different pen today since it's easier for me to erase things. Okay, um, so let's say you know for the D input, it make changes. It first stays at low, and make changes over here, and then stays high afterwards. So, what's gonna be the waveform for Q, right? So let's say initially Q is also zero, or that's the initial state. So tell me, when does Q becomes high? Very good, right? Q does not become high, right? At R1, right? It raises high right after R2, right? Usually there's some delay. We're gonna discuss that, right? Right at the edge, R2, right over here. Okay, or, uh, where's my, some of my, uh, some of my uh, pointers not working today. That's fine. Uh, right, so right at this edge, okay. All right, so Q is gonna be looking like this, right? Uh, so I think last time some of you asked, right? So what about the falling edge, right? So like this one, half one, right? Just look at the falling edge, first falling edge. Okay, um, Q is not gonna change because right, the, right, if you look at the falling edge, right? So the clock, let's just focus on F1, the clock stays high first, right? So that's where the first door or L1 is gonna stay closed, right? So L1 will not accept new input right, in the first place. So there's no way that this new D will propagate to the final Q, the final output, right? With the output side of L2. Make sense? Okay, so this is basically how a flip flop works, right? It goes through this uh, two door, you know, going through two doors. And at any given time, right, one door will stay open, the other one will stay closed. So that's how you can enable this, uh, right? So this edge sensitive device. So how do we build a, a negative edge trigger or falling edge trigger free flop in this case? What do we do? So what do we drop from the circuit diagram? Any ideas? Yeah, this is a positive edge, right? This is a rising edge trigger. Yes, right? So to build a negative edge trigger, so we just have to you know, invert a clock signal, right? So we can just drop the first inverter, that's it. Okay, so this is the free flop, right? So again, I have to say this, right? So, you know, over and over again, this is an edge sensitive device, okay? So we actually need the input to be steady and stable right before the edge. And then this, this change is gonna be captured, right? So at the edge and the output will change. Right, right after the edge. Okay, so let's do more exercise. Um, here's a slightly more complex circuit. Okay. Again, this is DFF, right? Flip flop. We have two flip flop here. Right. right. Somehow I can only see the this mouse, but not my uh, the highlighter. So Y and Z, right? So both of them are flip flops. Right, and we have an end gate, right, which is connecting to both Y and Z free flops. So, same exercise, right? Let's name the edges R1, R2, R3. So, let's say Y and Z are both zeros to start off with. So, when does Y change? When does Y raise to one? At which edge? not R1, right? Because A and B changes after R1, okay? So Y is not gonna, gonna respond for a while until, okay, until we see the next rising edge, which is R2, right? So what is Z? 
we look at this diagram, right? So Z is not really different right, from Y. They are pretty much the same, right? They're doing the same thing. Okay, so they're connecting the same input. So in this specific case, so Z also arises, right? And R2, so based on the waveform of Z mirrors Y in this case, right? Okay, so this is a simple case, right? Any questions? If not, let's look at the slightly different case. Now that I connect the output of Y to the input of Z. Okay. So in terms of Y, we are seeing the same waveform, right? Uh, you know, it rises at R2, right? Right, Z is gonna stay zero, right, for a while. When does Z change? When does Z change? Very good. R3, right? Z is not gonna change at R2, okay? Because Y has not changed yet, right before the edge, right before R2. Y changes right after R2, right? So later on, you know, uh, we may actually draw a square waveform, right? So, you know, in some cases, you know, it may not be, you know, that, Straightforward to tell, right? So whether they are perfect aligning, right? The edges or one is light after another, right? So uh, in case, but here's one thing, right? So you want to make sure that the input, right, has already changes slightly before the edge. Okay, this actually is actually sort of setup time. This is something that we're going to discuss in a week or so, right? Basically, why the, the input needs to change right before the edge, right? Before it can be captured, right, by the feedback. So in this case, Y actually changes, right? So after edge, so Z will not respond, right? Until the next edge, which is R3. And also you can look at this, this curve, right? This waveform. So really, uh, you will see this, this spike, right? This spike, right? So if you look at this uh, register, right? So really, you know, in many cases, people just call register as a one cycle delay, right? Hopefully you guys see the, the reason. So Z is basically a delayed, one cycle delayed version of Y, right? Then we connect the output of Y to the input of Z because we actually need to go through one more cycle before we see the change on the, on the Z output. All right, so this is flip-flop, okay? D flip-flop. Any questions? Does it make sense? Okay, if not, feel free to ask. So we can actually use uh, the flip-flop, right, to build uh, some other interesting things. Right? So this is something that you guys are using and building, right, in lab two. So we have something called toggle flip-flop, right? Uh, so we said it's a TFF or toggle flip-flop, toggle FF. Uh, we have an uh, input called T, right? So when T is one, output toggles. Right? Output toggles means that, you know, we are basically uh, changing the output from zero to one. When the output is one, ones, then we change it to invert it to zero, right? It keep talk, talking up if t is one. Otherwise, uh, if t is zero, we hold the state. Okay. So uh, turns out that uh, this building block, right? So, you know, we are basically using D flip flop to build this uh, T flip flop, and this T flip flop can be used as another building block to build counters. Okay? So there's something that we're going to show pretty soon. Uh, so let's first see uh, what exactly is uh, a T flip flop. Okay. So how do we build it? So over here, I have this uh, another mystery, uh, mystery gate. Right? Uh, it's unknown what it's doing, right? um, but let's look at the behavior. Right? So actually we just need one gate. So let's say we have a unknown gate. Right? So what we really want is um, this is a queue, right? we connect the queue since we have this uh, right? feedback pass. Again, for sequ sequential logic, we always have the feedback pass. Right? So we connect the queue. And if t is one, we get q naught, right? So that's what we want. Again, this is the same, right? Unknown gate, if q, we put q here, and if t, so this is t, right? If t is zero, we get the same q. So what is this gate? We have seen this behavior before, right? When t is one, the, one, the input is one, so it flips, toggles, it flips. Otherwise, it stays the same. Right, very good. So this is basically exclusive or exclusive or, right? And this is the the boolean expression, right? 
all we need to do is to add an XOR, that's it, right in front of D. And then we connect one of the input to Q. Okay, so this is a, a toggle flip-flop, right? And this is something that I hope you're already familiar with, right? So, you know, we stop two. And uh, using this flip-flop can actually build different kind of pointer, uh, counters, not pointers, okay? So we can build uh, up counters, down counters, right? There are many different ways, right? For up counter, you know, basically count up, right? Of course, we can count down. And we can also, you know, stop at a certain point, right? And then roll back, right? That's the dy by n, basically do some module behavior. But we can also have a range, right? Like this. We can also specify a, a start, right? Uh, a start point and end point, right? End to end, right? We can count between, right? This range or this interval. And we actually want to update the, the output, right? At any, at every clock cycle. But the output depends on the, Right. So do we output zero or one or two or three? That depends on the, the state of the counter in the previous cycle. Right. So this is very much a sequential logic because we need to remember the past. Right. So how exactly do we build this? Um, let's look at let's let's just build this one. Okay. Let's just look at up counter. And let's try to uh, identify some of the, the patterns. Okay. Um, um, so what is dy by n? Right, so I'm just asking, what is this? Right, so basically this is a, you know, when we count up to a certain value, right? In this case, n, right? We count from zero to n minus one, and then we, uh, then we roll back, right? We reset. So this is basically like uh, doing, right? So basically it's like doing this, right? It's like doing a modulo n. Um, okay, so this is basically module uh, in, uh, for the sake of simplicity, right? So some people just call it dy by n. All right, so let's look at this up counter. So what's the, the pattern here? So if you look at the LSB, right? LSB means this LSB, less significant bit. So it toggles every clock cycle, right? For LSB which is um, pretty obvious, every clock tick. How about the middle one? So what is the pattern here? It toggles, so every two clock cycles, right? To some extent, um, but is there any interesting behavior over here? So look closely, right? So basically it toggles for this bit, right? Again, for this middle bit, it toggles every time the LSB is one. Right, see here, every time the LSB is one, it toggles. Right? Every time the previous LSB, right, in the previous cycle, or the current cycle, you know, whatever, you know, we can use a different reference point. Right? Every time you know, the LSB is one, in the next cycle, by right, the middle bit, by right, the second bit, it's gonna toggle, it's gonna change value, change state. Okay, so hopefully this is clear, right? If this is clear, uh, let's, let's look at this guy, MSB. What's the pattern here? When does N MSB toggles? Right, so I'm saying every time two bit toggles from one to zero. Yes, so but what about, right, so this is one way to look at it. Can we look at both the middle bit and LSB? What's the pattern there? When does MSB toggles? Right, so actually when both of those, right, are ones. Right, so this is the, the pattern, see here? Then both of them are ones, right? which makes sense, right? So it actually toggles every clock, so four clock cycles. All right, so why do we care about this? Right, so actually, once we see these patterns, it's uh, very straightforward for us to to build the, the counter using these T flip flops, right? Because we want to do the we want to use the the toggling behavior of the the flip flop, right? TFF to build this counter. Let's see how we do this. 
So here's the counter. Okay. It's surprisingly regular and simple. Okay. So this one, this is the LSB. Okay. So this is the, the MSB. Right, so for LSB, we connect one to T, right? Which means LSB toggles every single clock cycle. And then we drag, right? So there's a connection here, actually, this connection here. So we connect Q0, right? All the way here, right? This means that when LSB is one or Q0 is one, this bit is gonna toggle, right? Right, so for the last one, MSB, so you know, we have these two connections, right? As simple as this. So basically Q0 and Q1, they're both ones. Next cycle, Q2 is gonna toggle. This is how we build a counter, right? right? Any questions? Okay, so if not, right, again, this is the, the pattern, right? So this is how we uh, build a counter by leveraging, uh, exploiting these patterns, okay? by looking at the behavior of the toggling for Q0, Q1, Q2. All right, so this is the waveform. Okay? So uh, basically, again, you know, we have the nice, nice pattern, right? Q0 toggles every single clock cycle, Q1 every two clock cycles, Q2 every four clock cycles. And then if you just read off, right? So the waveform. So later on, you guys need to be able to read this waveform, right? So waveform will be your friend for debugging your logic, right? Especially when you give it more complex circuit, right? Okay. You guys see the, right? So you can directly read it off, right? So in, indeed, we are doing the, the counting, right? So, um, and at this point, right, when we come up to seven, right? So this is, since we only have three bits, right? We can only count up to seven. So this is where actually, you know, the, the counter will automatically, right, uh, wrap around or reset, right, back to zero. So and in many cases, we just call it a sort of free running up counter. Uh, and we just let it run. All right. Okay, so this is TFF. Right? If there are not, no questions, let's move on to the next topic.